And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. The great book of Revelation, the unveiling. That is to say, Christ's teachings through John, saying, let's make it no one. Uh, and John was taken to the Lord's Day, which means the first day of the millennium. And he said, I'm going to show you things that will happen just before and just after. So now John, from chapter 4, has been taken from earth concerning the churches to heaven to show us what's happening there. So you don't have any hidden spots here. And on into chapter 5, he showed us who was worthy to open the book, that is to say, the Word of God. And that is those that possess the key of David, that know the genealogy, the correct genealogy of the true Messiah, and quite frankly, know the difference between the true Messiah and the false. And he stated in verse 6 of this fifth chapter we're now in, the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. He showed us this plummet stone that had seven pairs of eyes. Do you know what a plummet stone is as it is utilized in Zechariah chapter 3 and 4? It holds a straight line. It's a plumb bob. And it keeps everything straight with God's Word. And that's what God's Word and God's teachers do is keep people straight with the word of the living God. Now, those seven spirits we found out working through that seven pairs of eyes, it's the Holy Spirit utilizing God's election, but it is the Spirit of God. And he let us know what those spirit, that se the seven spirits were in the last verse we covered in the last lecture, verse 12. And there's a very beautiful thing in the manuscripts in that particular verse because you have an and preceding each spirit. That and is a polysendenton, which means there, there is a great deal more meant than is said. Uh, another way you could simplify it from that in English is that it is emphatic. It really super... Um, uh, emphasizes each of the seven. Like as an example, it says to receive power. That's one. One of the spirits of God. Power. And riches. Riches that man has difficulty even understanding. And, there's that polysendent and again, and wisdom. And naturally, all wisdom flows from God. The beginning of loving God is true wisdom and the beginning of knowledge. And strength. You know, if you truly love Him and you enjoy the Holy Spirit, He gives you whatever strength you need to meet the occasion that's approaching you. Okay? You can cut it. You're a can-do type person and honor. You're going to do it with dignity, and you're going to do it right. And, and glory. That means with worship. Worship to Almighty God and appreciation. And, of course, last of the seven spirits, blessings. God's spirits always bring blessings. The reason I'm spending a little bit of time on these seven spirits of God the Holy Spirit in its parts through, its, through God's children, His 7,000 elect. And I must remind you again, seven simply means spiritual completeness. And there were seven of those spirits. Each one of them a blessing within itself to any individual that participates in following Almighty God. But we're about to go into the seals, which is something you must receive into your mind to know and to understand what, is, what, what will um, uh, happen before and even after. So as we continue then, a word of wisdom from our Father, chapter 5, the great book of Revelation. Let's pick it up with verse 13, and it reads, 
and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power. There it is again. Be unto him that sit upon, sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lord forever and ever. And so it is. That honor and those blessings and that power will always be his. God is the same yesterday. He will be today and he will be tomorrow. You can count on him. That's why you can be so stable in your actions and following him. Verse 14. And the four beasts said, these are these living creatures, the zoon, uh, amen. Now that's that. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. The twelve patriarchs and the twelve apostles, however it may be, Judas or, or Mathis, um, worshiping Almighty God, who is deserving of it. But those seven spirits still emulating, coming forth from that throne. It will be written in certain places that this flow of pure water runs from underneath that throne. That is that spirit that's all enfolding all loving, all caring. It is our Father's word. Now, we come to chapter 6, which is the seals. Now, a seal is something that you, it is a truth that is fixed. It's, it's not something that's going to change, but it is a seal also of knowledge that you must have in your mind and the seals are not given in chronological order. I want to say that again so you're not deceived. Seals are not given in chronological order until the sixth seal surfaces. Up until that time, they basically are of, uh, uh, given in order of importance for you to have sealed in your mind. The first seal, of course, is going to be the most important. It's the most, uh, you, it could get you into the most trouble if you were not to be aware of that seal. So having said that, chapter 6, verse 1, let's plow right into it. Let's see if you can absorb the seals of the living God. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, who was able to open them? The Lamb, the Lamb of God. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. Come and, come and look at this. Verse 2, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, um, in the Greek, this loses quite a bit in the translation because Remember back in chapter 4, the bow that was around our Father's throne is like a rainbow, a prism of colors, the Shekinah glory enfolding Him. This word in the Greek is toxon. In other words, it's a, and it means a poor, cheap fabric imitation. You've got to learn the truth from the faults, okay? Here you have the Antichrist arriving on a white horse, exactly as it will be described that the Messiah shall. It was, it, the pro it was prophesied Messiah would come riding that white stallion way back in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 gives you the first advent where he would ride on the ass of a colt, a, a donkey. Uh, he came as a babe to be crucified. But in verse 10, he returns on that stallion to conquer, not to be crucified, but to rule with a rod of iron. So there's nothing new under the sun when you absorb God's word. But here you have this cheap imitation riding down the way here. Take a, got a crown, calling himself king, calling himself Jesus. And... A lot of the world will believe it because his message is, I've come to rapture you away. Okay. And I know that upsets some people, but I'd rather have you a little bit upset and saved rather than lost. 
to the seducer, for he is a conqueror, and he conquers quite well. Now, um, Jesus told us, he was asked at one time, what, what's it going to be like when all this happens? What's it going to be like when you return at this second advent? And he told us, I mean, in detail in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Now, would he have reminded us of a deceptor um, in Mark 13 when he was asked, what's it going to be like? What's it going to what's it going to look like at your return, the second advent? And what did he tell us in verse five and six of Matthew 13? And you, I'm sorry, in Mark 13. And you might as well hold your place there. We're going to be going back and forth here. I want to show you how Christ foretold us in detail what these seals were and what you were expected to do in relationship to them. So. In regards to this fake one, this toxon banner waving falsehood, what did Jesus say, verse 5 and 6, when he was asked about the end? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. That's his first warning that you be not deceived. Because that's what Satan does. He goes forth to conquer and to deceive. Verse 6, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, I am Jesus, and shall deceive many. In other words, you're going to have a lot of people come in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, claiming to be Christian preachers, claiming to be Christians. He said, they're going to come in my name. That means they, they have Christ's name, calling themselves Christian. But they will deceive. They have religions of their own, rather than the truth from God's word. The deceiver shall come first. This is why this rider of the white horse happens to be the first seal. It is paramount. It is most important, because it is the most dangerous for a Christian especially, at the time that John was taken here to the first day of the millennium to show us what happens before and just after. And you're in that generation that's just before. So it's extremely important that you know and understand the seals. Let's return, if we may then, to chapter 6 of, Je of uh, Revelation. Let's pick it up with verse 3 and let's understand another seal, if we may hear. And um, verse 3 reads, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. C come and see with understanding. Don't just play with it. Understand. Look at it. And there went out another horse that was red. This probably means war, okay? And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth. And, they, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And of course, Almighty God has the sword that counts, and the, the sword that um, is of, of value. What is Christ's sword? It's his tongue. It's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Satan's sword is a bunch of lies, a bunch of deceit. And here he has this one tool, this war horse. And he brings this war that kills innocent people, seemingly for no reason, maybe even in the name of religion. Be very careful, my friend. Now, let's, let's return back to Mark 13 and see what Jesus would say about relationship to that second seal. Verse 7 of Mark chapter 13 reads, And when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. And we hear, what, what is the opposite of wars and rumors of wars? It's peace. Peace, peace, peace. The road map to peace. The way to peace. But there will be no peace. And this is the warning that you will have. 
don't be upset that there are wars and troubles of wars and you got a bunch of peaceniks running around that absolutely have no conception. When these scriptures were reading or like tomorrow or today's newspaper giving you the knowledge and the information to be consumed and understood. So naturally there's a red war horse because um, Jesus made it clear in plain English. It's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Don't get nervous about it, okay? And again, you know when the false Christ comes, he'll be saying, calling himself the Prince of Peace. Now let's, let's return to Revelation chapter 6 and we'll pick it up in verse 8. I'm sorry, verse um, 5. Uh, pick it up in verse 5 and it reads, And when he had opened the third seal, here we come to the third, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. You come and look at this. Come with understanding. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. That's famine. That's starvation. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. You might say, I, I always think when I read this verse of Amos chapter 8 where it says um, uh, they have a set of balances selling molded grain to people. And then it goes on to declare in the 13th verse of that 8th chapter of Amos, the famine in the end times is not for bread, but the famine is for hearing the real true word of God. So uh, that's what you want to pay attention to, and that's what you want to understand. It's the real word of God. So here we see these scales coming up and uh, signs of famine, verse 6 of uh, Revelation chapter 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny. In other words, you're going to work all day like for, say, a loaf of bread. And three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, now what does oil and wine signify? The oil is the anointing oil of our people that brings to pass healing when done with the true Messiah, not the fake. There's a great difference. And naturally the wine, the first miracle that Jesus Christ performed, turning water to wine, is his blood. His blood shed that paid the price that we as sinners can be accepted into his election that have eyes to see and ears to hear to be able to relish and enjoy these beautiful truths that flow like the oil and honey from the very word of God, okay? And that wine that gives that warmth, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, as the, the etymology of it being as the coo of a dove, that love bird that it's warming and cooing to us, okay? And, um, and what, what a beautiful thing that uh, we, we have there. Now, verse 7, as we continue. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see, come and look at this, come with understanding. And um, uh, verse 8 reads, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. This means death. Okay. And his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. Uh, now, this word beast is only used one time in the entire Bible, okay? You might say, well, we've covered the word beast several times. Not, not, trans, not from what this word beast is translated from. It's therion. And it actually means a holding place for evil spirits and Satan, quite frankly, Antichrist. It's their home. So 
when you tr properly translate it, you know exactly where they're coming from. No excuses, no doubts. Okay. And, uh, and so it is. Now, uh, I, I want to go back to uh, verse 8 in Mark 13. Could it be that we would have a follow-up of this same warning? this war and starvation and so forth. Verse 8 of Mark chapter 13, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be earthquakes in diverse places and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of the sorrows. Th this word sorrows is, it, it, it means labor pains, okay? Birth pains. Why? Because it's the birth of a new age is happening before your very eyes, if you have eyes to see, and if you have ears to hear. You're living in that generation. These wars are not hidden, and many people are sickened, and they don't understand the brave, gallant Christian soldiers that stand the ground to keep this evil away from our people, our homeland, our children, our grandchildren. And, and they march with their ignorance and in their ignorance because they have no conception whatsoever of what's happening in this world. It's going down exactly as it's written, dear one. Don't ever forget it. Our Father knows. It was 2,000 years ago when he was asked, what's it going to be like at your return? He's telling you. And do you know something? It fits today. It fits now. Okay, returning then to, to Revelation and chapter 6, and we're going to pick it up uh, with verse 9. And verse 9 reads, And when he had opened the fifth seal... Here we've got five. When he had opened the fifth seal, um, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. You got that? Don't read over any of that. I saw the souls, I saw the people that were slain for the word of God. I uh, saw th that uh, under that altar that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, don't ever let some cracker tell you that people are out here dead in a hole in the ground. These shed their blood. They were pure flesh bodies on earth. They shed their blood and they are now under the very altar of the living God because they held that line. They held that testimony. And they were slain because they were teaching and living that word of God as God decrees, just as you are. Don't, don't ever forget it and how important it is that we, we know and we understand. Verse 10 to continue. And they cried with a loud voice. They're, they're talking, saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? When are you going to take vengeance on earth against those that have done this to us? Don't worry, Father doesn't sleep. He has, he has a lot of patience, endurance. Verse 11, what did he do? What did our Father say in his compassion? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season, that's just a little bitty while, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, it hadn't happened yet. Now, we know that, Father, if you have the seal of God in your forehead, Satan can't touch you. Unfortunately, people can't, but Satan can't. 
And here you have that, that these have a witness and they want revenge, but Father says, hey, there's still some people living, God's elect on earth, that have a witness to give. Just a little season, they're going to give that witness. Now, did Jesus teach that back in Mark 12, 13, rather? I don't know. Let's, let's go there and let's find out. Let's pick it back up, if we may, with chapter 13, verse 9. And we're going to stay here in this for a little while so that you clearly understand that witness. Jesus continues in Mark chapter 13, verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, that Sanhedrians, and in the synagogues, that's of Satan, you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake. For whose sake? For your sake? No, for my sake, Christ speaking. For a testimony against them. That's the purpose, is to, to deliver the word of God. In truth, in fact, verse 10, and the gospel must first be published among all nations. These trials will be made public. They will be televised. Uh, Satan himself sitting at the head of the synagogue is the spurious Messiah, the Antichrist, pleading with people to love him and to follow him, to believe him. Verse 11, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Don't even consider it, okay? Neither do you premeditate. Don't plan ahead. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour. What hour is that? The hour of temptation when Antichrist is here on earth. That speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. Those seven spirits of God boiling and churning that real truth and testimony out before the world. You know, this profile chapter to this is Luke 21, and it stipulates there that when the Holy Spirit speaks through you, even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say. Verse 12. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. What does that mean? A, a brother is not going to deliver a brother up to death, but a brother, a, a brother that thinks this is Jesus, he's talking, been to church all of his life, sit on that front pew. I mean, worship the Lord, but never studied the Word of God, always listened to the reverend, didn't know the seals of God in their chronological order of which was most important, the false Christ comes first. They think this is Jesus. And as a good Christian, they're going to say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on my brother. He's misled and they'll turn their own brother into death, which is to say Satan. That's one of his names. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, documentation. And uh, the same way with the father, a son, or a mother, a daughter. They think it's Jesus. They're, and they're begging for mercy for their child right to Satan. Deception, deception runs deep. That's why it's so important to relish and absorb the truth of God's Word. Verse 13, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. For what purpose? For my name's sake. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You're going to conquer. Verse 14, And when you shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand, then let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains. Where's Judea? That's where Jerusalem is. And we know from 2 Thessalonians, Antichrist sets up his throne on Mount Zion, the rock, the dome of the rock, claiming to be Jesus, okay, Messiah. 
So giving us the location. Well, what, what does it mean here, the ab abomination of desolation? Well, uh, the ninth chapter and the 27th verse of the great book of Daniel makes it very clear. Dr. Moffat would translate this word, it, he. Why? Because in the Greek, there is no word that means her, she, it, or uh, the subject that is being discussed determines the value of the word, whether it should read it or he. Now, naturally, if it's a condition, it would be it. If it is an entity, it would be translated he. So what does the ninth chapter of Daniel, chapter verse 27, declare? It says, in the middle of the week, the desolator, not desolation, the desolator, an entity, a person, the Antichrist, shall come on the wings of desolation and deceive the world if that be possible. So when you see the Antichrist coming, you better know it's at the door, okay? Verse 15, And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of his house, you're not going to need it. Where does a watchman stand? On the roof. And you better, be a, you better be a watchman. And you better be watching, especially now. 16, And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. In other words, the end is so close, you don't need a change of clothes. 17, But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. This has nothing whatsoever to do with a mother carrying a, a child in her womb. That's a blessing. But it has to do with false impregnation, but with the mark of the beast. That is to say, to have someone accept the false Messiah and, and be impregnated with his thoughts, his teachings, his study. And when the true Christ returns, expecting to find a virgin bride as it is written in... Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, uh, unfortunately, he said, I'm afraid, Paul would say, I'm afraid some of you are going to be like Eve and seduced by the wicked one, that's to say the devil, the word expatio, wholly seduced. So make sure you're not, uh, and, and giving suck means to even be doing Satan's work, be helping build his church, to, to help him build a congregation. One more verse, and pray ye that your flight be not in the winter. When, when do you want to be harvested? Do you know of any time that you harvest figs or anything else in the middle of the winter? You would be harvested out of season. Make sure that Satan doesn't harvest you out of season before the true Christ and the real marriage tra transpires, takes place. Don't be deceived. We're living in a generation that even the prophets wish they could live now. If this, this generation, when these things are going down, playing out, prophecies rushing to the forefront, you do. You live there. What an opportunity, you know, to have a destiny and a purpose to serve the living God to stand in the stead of that Holy Spirit, that is to say, allowing the Holy Spirit to use you, not even premeditating what you would say, but saying, God, use me. You live in that generation. Think about it. Hey, don't miss the rest, the, the rest of this chapter, next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you?